Welcome to TrainX's 30-minute explainer for Agile PM, the most established Agile project management method. Thank you for taking your time to view this video. In a moment, we'll dive in and learn Agile PM by following a very simple, easy-to-understand case study. First of all, some quick terminology. We'll cover these ideas in more depth throughout the video. The philosophy is the big idea, essentially how to gain business value quickly, on time and on budget. The principles help build the mindset and behaviours, bringing the philosophy to life. The process model will soon make sense to you. Essentially, projects have a beginning, a middle and an end. The model has phases. Feasibility is an example. We'll discuss and use the phases to create a suitable project life cycle to represent how our project's activities and focus develop through time. Within the project environment, people take on roles such as project manager. We'll discuss these. The products are the necessary pieces of documentation, including plans. These are only used if needed and are clear, purposeful and as lean as possible. The key practices include ways of prioritising work and ensuring effective communication. I'm Simon Garlick, your trainer. I have a background in business analysis and project work for businesses, public services and software development organisations. I also specialise in learning and development training trainers in instructional skills. In this capacity, I've worked for Microsoft, Adobe and the UN, amongst many organisations. Contact me for a free Agile PM briefing. After the 30 minutes, I'll describe Agile PM's training and certification process. The best value training embodies the Agile approach. Overly complicated training events with over four classrooms are not in any learner's interest, wasting your time and money. Our ideas can easily save you over a £1,000 for a single training event. This explainer doesn't require any specific Agile knowledge and I haven't used terminology from any other methodology, such as Scrum. This keeps the ideas clear. In practice, Scrum and Agile PM work perfectly together. Any particular specialist areas, such as estimating and testing, are summarised. Other TrainX resources will help you with these at the depth required to run a sophisticated project. We use a simple case study which has an IT-based solution, but as long as you understand that a browser shows web pages from a web server, then that's all you'll need. Video has an even pace, but feel free to pause and review. There are no big lists to learn. Concepts and terminology are introduced naturally in step with the case study. Closed captions will help with your understanding and memory. I don't directly read the text from the slides to you, rather parallel it with added value and examples. ABC Room Hire provides meetings and IT training rooms by the hour. The ground floor reception is shared and their meeting rooms are on floor 8. The only way to book a room is to phone or walk up to reception. Reception discuss your requirements, look at the paper-based planner and then make a note in their diary. This has obvious problems being a single user manual system. The room administrator based on floor 8 constantly has to visit reception to check the schedule to then work out how to resource the rooms for each event. Agile PM can solve ABC's problem. The philosophy says we'll gain best value by understanding our real goals and then quickly putting a suitable solution in place. Keeping our people happy and focused will greatly improve our results. There are eight principles that support this. We'll introduce them as we work through the case study. Projects allow organisations to implement change. ABC are losing money from inefficient room scheduling and are losing customer ratings also. The CEO recognises change is needed, embraces Agile and decides to hold a provisional workshop with her colleagues to gain their insights into solving the room booking issues. Whiteboards are incredibly useful for capturing and organising the output of a discussion. You usually have to be there to see how they evolve. Let's pick out the key points from ABC's discussion. They wish to use desktop and phone based browsers for their in-house team to manage the bookings. They are not sure whether to use their own server or a cloud-based one initially. This will be investigated further. The CEO wants an in-house solution as soon as. Collectively, the business and technology staff think it will take at least a month with the input of six or so people to develop the database, the web pages and reports. The goal is to attain 100% of the potential room hire revenue. Currently, they assess they are losing 50% of it. They believe customer ratings will soar once this is done and think 4.5 plus out of 5 is possible. The CEO thinks they can then launch a more sophisticated version, bringing in some 125,000 per year, but this will need further development and good branding to aid marketing. The risk is that a competitor will jump in, taking the potential business first, or that the marketing will be difficult, resulting in poor uptake. 
We're still pre-project. There is no project manager at this point. The CEO puts all the key points from the whiteboard discussion into Agile PM's Terms of Reference product. The CEO, in consultation with colleagues, decides to fund Agile PM's feasibility phase only, committing money and resources, including a project manager, for two weeks' effort. The idea behind this is to establish what the solution could look like at a very high level and see if there are any showstoppers, either technically or from the business side. We now have a project. Agile projects have three categories. Project level is where the high-level decisions are made. Solution development team is where the deliverables are created and supporting is for additional advice and Agile PM process guidance. We'll look at the project level now and then look at the other categories as we learn more. You'll see that we have four color-coded interests. The CEO will be interested in the business doing well and in this example will be the business sponsor, owning the business case and providing funding. Essentially, they are the key player within the project. The business visionary makes decisions at the highest level on behalf of the business sponsor. In our case, the CEO may wish to hold this role themselves also. This role requires an enthusiastic view of how things will be in the future and answers practically all questions posed regarding what the business wishes to have. The project manager embodies Agile's servant leader ideal. They don't micromanage, instead they clear impediments for the team and take responsibility for on-time and at-quality delivery of the project's products, enabling value to the business. The technical coordinator is the top technical role and decision maker. They resolve technical disputes within the project and also ensure technical consistency across the project. In a building project with two teams of plumbers, they'd ensure that both teams were using copper piping rather than one preferring copper with the other choosing plastic. The business analyst role is in green and orange, indicating responsibility for solution and business aspects. They also span the project level and solution development team and are responsible for ensuring the business needs are understood so that the products developed bring value. This is not a management role, nor should they take on the role of business ambassador who makes day-to-day -day decisions on the project's details. We'll study this role later. In summary, business analyst is a subtle and important role that is often underrated and requires recognition by anyone involved in projects. It's easy to overdo or underdo how much detail to go into at the start of a project. Planning for every last nut and bolt, referred to as big design up front, is almost certainly doomed to failure, as typically and reasonably a customer will change their ideas as they understand more of what they require, or as a new technology or thinking comes into being, making planned areas of the solution redundant. Historically this is summarised as waterfall, with analysis and then design steps done sequentially, with change being difficult to encompass. Agile PM endorses enough design up front. This allows the big picture view and governance to be incorporated without overdoing planning and detail until it's needed. We'll illustrate this shortly. For our case study, we'd say we need daily, weekly and monthly room hire reports and they'll be in PDF format. What we won't do is say what the exact wording, colour, logo and content will be until we start to develop the particular report. This allows knowledge that reports will be created within the project, be in scope, and for reasonable estimates and costings to be done up front without doing all the relative predictable design work before it's needed. No design up front, being very simplistic, means just get on with it. This can work very well when no governance is required, but doesn't sit well with most organisations that have strategic aims and accountants. The business sponsor owns the business case. This contains the business vision, how the organisation will work after the project has been delivered. In our case, we'll say that booking a room is now seamless, 100% accurate and can be done from anywhere. The proposed solution is described, a web-based booking facility along with possible variations, each with its own costs and benefits. The investment appraisal, described simplistically, details how the project will generate more value than it costs to deliver. The Prioritised Requirements List, or PRL, is a product first created in the feasibility phase. Initially it contains a few very high-level requirements that describe the entire scope of the project, allowing initial top-down estimates. For our example, these would include that it must provide management reports, must be multi-user, meet government data compliance, etc. 
There should be less than 10 requirements to ensure that EDUF is being followed and to avoid forcing any particular solution unless there are project constraints already in place. Initial broad estimates are based on the PRL. These are top-down, not expected to be particularly accurate and have a broad range. Moscow prioritisation is used. Our next topic. Moscow prioritisation is utilised throughout the Agile world. M denotes must. Anything prioritised as a must that isn't present invalidates the value of the solution. A car must be drivable as an example. If all the musts are met, then the result will have value and is called the minimum usable subset. S stands for should. Shoulds that are missing mean there is some pain in using the product. Could indicates a best case nicety. Won't have for now can be used to exclude an idea that isn't required, but that seems necessary and that keeps reoccurring during meetings, etc. Moscow priorities have time frames. For example, our case study's automatic backup could be a could for the in-house version. If the could isn't delivered, then the IT administrator will have to manually back up the data. For the commercial version, the automatic backup becomes a must, as no one would buy it if their data could just go missing. Moscow helps with testing, and so the principle, never compromise quality, is at play here. All project management methods have triangular diagrams. Here are ours. A traditional approach delivers 100% of the features, even if some are minor, and uses tolerance for time and cost. In the event of project slippages, the separate quality testing stage can be rushed, leading to quality compromises. In the Agile PM approach, if we've done a good job with our estimates, then we should just be able to deliver all our musts, shoulds and coulds on time and on budget with known fixed resources. The quality of the delivery will be 100% of the project's stated quality level. Not over nor under, as we have tested all the deliverables using their acceptance criteria. In the event of an issue affecting developer availability etc, then the coulds can be de-scoped, in other words left out. If necessary, the shoulds may be de-scoped too. This approach will give us a 40% contingency of coulds and shoulds, which is quite generous. The musts will still be delivered to give us the essential functionality, the minimum usable subset. One key principle here is deliver on time. Requirements are analysed by the business analyst and developed into features, deliverables, by the solution development team. A format called user stories is often used. The person's role, their requirement and goal are listed. Often they are written on a paper card that's indexed. To aid testing and quality, acceptance criteria are also recorded. A system that displays room availability in random order and takes 10 minutes to do this isn't going to help the receptionist answering a phone inquiry. Specifics like sort order and response time make good acceptance criteria. The solution architecture definition captures a wide range of business and technical information. For example, how the new system will affect the business. People will need training, job roles may alter, new staff may be required and so on. New hardware such as servers may be needed and will require maintenance. For IT projects, there will also be technical development environments in place that require documenting. The development approach definition describes the project standards for analysis, testing, configuration management, etc. The technical coordinator produces this document. The project manager ensures development is in accordance. The management approach definition documents success criteria, reporting milestones and any inter-project dependencies. Governance may be rigorous or relaxed. The project approach questionnaire, PAQ, helps determine the organization's understanding and acceptance of Agile PM's usage. Communication requirements to various parties, known as stakeholders, are described here, as are roles and responsibilities, along with any variations from Agile PM's recommendations. Stipulations on how to manage risk, change and exceptional circumstances are described. The delivery plan is created in feasibility. It's based on the requirements from the PRL. Initially, it only has detail for the activities during the foundations phase, such as scoping and estimating workshops, which will allow a clear review of the proposed solution to emerge. In feasibility, all the products lack full detail, so the term outline is generally used for them. 
We have two proposed project increments. The first is the in-house booking system, which would have some high-level detail. The second, a potential commercial version, which would have very little detail, other than fixed dates if required. Estimates are driven by the PRL and are presented showing a wide range as detail is still emerging. Once sufficient work has been done, the project manager reviews the products and creates a feasibility assessment. This is a summary and leads to a recommendation to continue to foundations or to close the project if it has too little value. The project governance, in our example the CEO, then decides on whether to progress to foundations. Here the PRL for an example hotel refurbishment states that each bedroom must have two and should have three double sockets. If these were on the architect's initial drawing, then this could be an example of big design up front. Using Agile PM's enough design up front approach, the hotel manager and the electrician agree the positions of the sockets using their experience. The iterative cycle consists of conversation, thought, action, then conversation. If adjustments are needed, then a further cycle ensues. The Agile PM role for the hotel manager is business ambassador and the solution developer for the electrician. The SDT role of business ambassador is someone from the business who can make immediate and empowered decisions on behalf of the business. They could de-scope a could and depending on the management approach definition rules, potentially a should also. This allows immediate decisions to be made such as the location of a logo on a marketing brochure rather than through a lengthy change control process. The solution developer, typically there are three or four holding this role in the team, would be a software developer for our case study or the electrician from the previous example. The solution tester is someone with testing skills such as test driven development, TDD, a software development technique who is independent of the developer. Typically, each developer has the skills to test the other developer's work, building in quality and so holds the solution tester role also. The team leader role is typically held by the most appropriate person in the team for a certain set of tasks, such as deployment. Should additional business or technical expertise be required, then a technical advisor or business advisor can be brought in for a period. Team size guidelines are 5 to 9 persons. This could vary and still be viable depending upon the organisation. Our case study will have only one solution development team. A building restoration project might have three teams, builders, plumbers and electricians, each with its own set of people filling the SDT roles, so three team leaders, etc. The project manager would ensure their activities are sequenced at a high level, so we'd not have two teams in the same space simultaneously, etc. The lower level coordination, however, would be done by each team for itself. Self-organised and empowered teams are key in Agile PM. Facilitated workshops are discussed shortly. A DSDM coach may help with the Agile PM process when the team is not sufficiently experienced with Agile PM. We saw iterative development and its cycle of conversation, thought, action, conversation in the hotel refurbishment example. To control the cycle and make it time bound, to allow predictability and management, it is common to use structured time boxes. The length of these is typically 20 working days, enough time for development without too long a period where planning becomes inefficient, referred to as a planning horizon. Our example timings will be for a 20 day duration. At the initial meeting called kickoff, the SDT are provided with a subset of requirements from the PRL. They meet, ideally with the project manager present, with one hour allocated for each working week. So a cap of four hours for our example. Within kickoff, the SDT need to understand the time box's objectives, accept them as realistic, and agree on at least the high level acceptance criteria. Remember that the PRL's requirements development effort has already been top-down estimated during foundations, ideally by the team itself. Next is investigation, which includes a confirmation of the detail of the requirements and products to be delivered. The SDT creates a time box plan, which may be displayed on a clearly visible team board. 
Estimates are now bottom-up and effectively 100% accurate. Agreement is reached on the detailed acceptance criteria and any KPIs and other measures of success for the time box. Stipulations for these may be in the management approach definition. For example, time box review records may be required. The team leader will ensure their production, capturing feedback that may shape plans moving forwards. Investigation ends with a review which informs the next section, refinement. Here the bulk of the development is addressed, driven by priority and pragmatism. Each deliverable is tested from a technical and business perspective and is viewed as complete only once it meets its acceptance criteria. Ideally, all musts are developed first, though due to available skill sets and other constraints, it may be more time efficient to develop a should. Similarly to investigation, refinement ends with a review which includes actions for consolidation, which follows. Consolidation is where any loose ends are tied up, so that all deliverable products meet their acceptance criteria. Formal sign-off may occur here or in closeout. Products not meeting their acceptance criteria remain open on the PRL. Consolidation ends with a review, which informs closeout and may be a valuable governance touchpoint. Closeout follows with formal acceptance of the deliverables by the business visionary and technical coordinator. Typically a short time box retrospective workshop for the SDT follows to learn from the time box and to take actions to improve future time boxes. Establishing positive group dynamics is key to collaboration. Studies show that even in business, body language, facial expression and use of voice form the greater part of communication. Successful in-person meetings have subtle timings and interactions that do not carry into restricted video conferencing environments. These require more explicit structure and a higher frequency of interaction to be beneficial. In learning and development, in-person and live online are referred to as modalities. Mixing these modalities, for example where there are eight people in a physical meeting and then eight people, particularly strangers, Remotely connected in on their own camera is at odds with effective communication and learning and adversely affects the group dynamic. The emphasis is attempting to achieve as close to -to face-to-face communication as possible. Inadvertently isolating attendees degrades performance. A key face-to-face technique is the daily standard. The format is shown on the graphic. Any issues raised that cannot be absolutely immediately remedied are managed offline by the team leader. Facilitated workshops led by an impartial workshop facilitator are highly productive, well planned for, beneficial meetings. Empowered participants collaborate to reach the goal set on behalf of the workshop owner. A common example goal would be to create estimates for a particular requirement on the PRL. Facilitated workshops which are face to face are an excellent example of effective communication within the team. A picture paints a thousand words. Models and drawings have been used for centuries and aid understanding of concepts that might take thousands of words to describe and even then with limited success. Prototypes are just one example. The evolving solution is essentially everything being created which can include models, test scripts and so on. Generally, value is gained by frequently deploying project increments into use. For our example, deploying the in-house system before waiting to develop the commercial version would bring early value and influence the development of the later increment through lessons learned during the in-house usage. Baselining, simplistically, means understanding the exact elements that are deployed to allow consistency and is often tied in with version numbering and configuration management. We describe the timebox plan and timebox review records during timeboxing. Here the phases from the process model are configured to meet the life cycle of our case study. The evolutionary development phase is shown twice, once for each timebox before the deployment phase is reached. A subset of the requirements from the foundations level PRL relevant to the development focus of each timebox are assigned. Their Moscow priority may alter from the PRL's project level priority, e.g. a must may become a could. 
First, features meeting the sub-requirement subset of the database timebox are developed, then similarly for the subset for the user interface and management reports timebox. If at least all the musts have been developed, then the combined deliverables from both timeboxes can be deployed. Effectively, the first project increment is now the deployed solution. Here we've zoomed in for a quick revisit of timeboxing with some further detail. After kickoff comes investigation, where the timebox plan is created and typically recorded on a whiteboard called the team board. The plan will show allocated resources as needed with a sequence of activities. The investigation review takes place to inform development during refinement. In refinement, the main development work is done, driven by Moscow priority and practicality. Some teams will use Kanban, shown here, a system of indicating work to be done, work in progress and work completed. Easily visible whiteboards are sometimes referred to as information radiators or big visible charts. The refinement review takes place to inform activities during consolidation. In consolidation, any loose ends that can be tied up to allow deliverables to meet their acceptance criteria takes place. No new work is begun here, even for a remaining must. The consolidation review takes place to inform closeout. Closeout, potentially followed by a short retrospective for the SDT, completes the time box sequence. Our final project increment, the commercial version, is developed and deployed as the last solution increment. During the deployment phase, assemble encompasses the work to bring together what is to be released. A review informs the final decision to release the solution into operational use. Deploy is the act of putting the release into operational use. This enables the potential benefits of the solution and at this point any plans for business change will be enacted. The project review report is now updated. To summarise the project and state what has actually been delivered, the benefits enabled and any lessons learned. For completeness, here are the eight principles listed out. We've seen them in context at points during the video. Benefits for most projects accrue over time. Measuring this accrual allows the organisation to understand whether the project has met its objectives, particularly to provide measurable benefits in the timescale described in the business case. For our case study, we'd hope to see room management reaching its measure of 100% revenue and customer ratings reaching or exceeding 4.5 out of 5 in the timescale described. So in 30 minutes we've covered the key ideas of Agile PM. We've seen the method used to manage the on-time and on-budget creation of our project's deliverables. Additionally, these have been at the required quality level, allowing us to achieve our organization's goals. TrainX provide authorized training at exceptional quality. Currently with a 100% pass rate for Agile PM. We've achieved this by ensuring the quality of our provision is centred on our attendees and their requirements. We have a wider set of delivery options than any of the high throughput organisations and we'll present these to you now. Some providers put sales volume before quality and integrity and we'll provide you with public domain information to help you make an informed choice. We have a great depth of experience and this is borne out in our pass rates. Our aim is to ensure our learners benefit and that our pricing is realistic. I'm personally available to discuss your training requirements and will either act as your trainer or put you in touch with a reputable organisation. Your Agile PM training includes all the materials and exams 
along with the very high-end instruction that you should expect. We cover the entire syllabus for the foundation level exam. You'll receive a practice exam to ensure you understand the format and timings. Similarly, we cover the entire syllabus for the practitioner level exam. We are preparing a video on how to manage your learning, which will be uploaded presently. Booking is very simple. Contact us now to secure your training, provide you with the latest schedule and offers. I present free Agile PM briefings during the day, evening and weekends. Contact us now for your place. You'll need internet access and ideally a headset, though a laptop with microphone will work. Webcams are optional. Successful training requires the facilities to support the learners by allowing them to comfortably focus on the instructor, the learning materials and the instructional media. Cramped conditions and sub-optimal seating arrangements which force learners to sit at an angle for extended periods are counterproductive. Limited workspace where the learning materials are not optimally positioned or won't even fit on the desk further limits knowledge transfer. Large classroom capacities degrade performance. These are some of QA Learning's own marketing photos. QA Learning have excessively high prices, with some five-day events at over £3,000 per attendee, far exceeding £45,000 for a single capacity event. However, they also sell these at much lower prices through their second website. Many events have virtual attendees who pay the same fee despite the vast difference in costs between providing office space in central London and a WebEx connection. Equally, QA charge the same for a seat at a basic office building on a Leeds industrial estate as they do for their flagship at Tower Bridge. Mixing virtual and in-person learners is not optimal for learning. The attention spans and knowledge transfer techniques for the two audiences are quite different. QA state that the training is split into multiple sessions to keep learners focused and refreshed, but don't describe this in any detail. Their combined Agile PM events run for 25% longer than is necessary, possibly to compensate for the built-in inefficiencies. TrainX weekday events are capped at 10 learners, and all virtual courses and weekend events are capped at 8. We make certain that the classroom functions to the benefit of the learners with sufficient room and a clear view of the instructor and the instructional media. In practice, the deliveries have a virtual and an in-person audience, as we've just discussed, and have literally an attend from anywhere virtual audience. QA's marketing graphic shows seven physical learners and a single virtual learner. This is not the capacity that they aim to run the classes at and have a 16 learner cap. The winners here are the salespeople and shareholders, not the learners. For mixed modality events with virtual and in-person attendees, the instructor is put in a difficult position. QA's Attend From Anywhere promotional video. The trainer has to physically reposition himself for each audience, virtual and in person. Remember that the number of remote learners can be eight and that the technical exercises can be very demanding. So a trainer may have to connect to a minimum of eight remote servers 
as well as monitor the eight servers accessed via the physical classroom. To compound this further, some technical courses, such as Microsoft's infrastructure training, have several servers per learner. TrainX virtual events are capped at eight virtual only attendees. Our pricing for virtual attendees is lower, reflecting our cost savings. We consider the learner's time zone and avoid wide disparities by running separate events for separate regions. Our trainers will work with you to accommodate your time zone. In discussion with many of our learners and in line with current learning theory and business imperatives, We've also part-time, weekend and evening training deliveries that are learner-centred and currently unique in format. Most training companies want to keep their trainers working all hours. TrainX's view is we can provide optimised learning part-time. Our trainer can work with you in the morning, then someone else in the afternoon. Contact us for a free briefing. Here's the format for our full-time weekday events. Class times are 9am until 5pm. The deliveries are either in-person or virtual, with timings optimised for the particular modality. We cap at 8 virtual learners and 10 in-person attendees, as this has proven itself. We have a 100% pass rate with minimal pre-reading and evening work. In-person courses typically have the exams in line with the training. Virtual learners take their exams online at their convenience. Weekend events are excellent for career developers and contractors. We cap these at eight attendees for both the virtual and in-person events. There is a small amount of guided evening work between the two weekends, with the trainer available during the week to provide support if needed. Exams are typically taken online outside of the learning sessions. Many learners benefit from a shorter week, which allows them to be productive at work, while gaining their skills. For some learners, this equates to no evening work depending upon their work commitments in the day. The delivery pattern consists of morning or afternoon sessions on the first week for the foundation and then two full days to concentrate on the practitioner on the following week. Exams are typically taken outside of the learning sessions. Another of our unique formats is to cover the foundation over five weekly evening sessions, followed by four weekly sessions for practitioner. We realise that there may be an evening or two that isn't viable over a nine-week block, and we'll work with you to ensure completeness of learning. Exams are typically taken online outside of the learning sessions. In practice, all the events will run on the same day, for example, Monday. There are costs to run commercial training events and there's an expectation of a reasonable return. However, the training should be an investment so that you are the main beneficiary. The following guidelines are common sense. If you buy online, you've also distance purchasing safeguards in place, and you can use a credit card for added protection. Make sure that you don't buy an event in Aberdeen to then be told the day before you go that you have to attend in Birmingham and that the expenses are your concern. Get written confirmation of exactly where the event is running. Check the links and you'll see that QA solely own focus on training and sell the same events many months ahead at vastly lower pricing through focus. QA use the word trusted on their website, but their kite flying clearly displays a lack of integrity by an organisation that works with the NHS, local government, several universities, businesses and major technology providers. QA publish only 78 cherry-picked reviews, even though they provide over 500,000 learner days per year. Profits, including those for UK apprenticeship schemes, go offshore. QA have a history of double-figure percentage price rises. Knowledge Academy's directors have multiple companies in order to gain Google inches and capture business from people who may choose to avoid Knowledge Academy. Knowledge Academy claim to provide the best pricing in the industry, but their own other companies often have lower pricing.
Their address in Sheffield is essentially faked to gain a Google local listing. The office was disused and is now entirely utilised by CTS Training, who knew nothing of Knowledge Academy's usage. We hope that the Agile PM Overview has proven informative and enthused you in this excellently thought through mature and relevant methodology. We appreciate the time you've taken to view our video and hope that whatever route you take that it is enjoyable and productive. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've new videos in production and there are a number of specific overview videos already posted that give insight into our specific training events and their delivery approach. Thank you for viewing. We look forward to being of service.